Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. I know everyone will be joining in a little bit, uh, but good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today and welcome to the Hive Think Tanks webinar series. My name is Olivia and the, I'm the operations manager at the Hive and we're really excited to have you join us and hear from our portfolio company Blockstream and also the global CTO at, at TIPCO. So with that being said, I'll quickly go over um, today's best practices for the webinar and explain what the Hive Think Tank does. And then I'll pass it over to Ravi, the Hive's founder and managing director. So we do love questions. Um, so we'd love for you to use the Q&A button and not the general chat box um, at the bottom of your screen to ask our presenters questions. And then um, they'll kind of funnel through the questions at the end of the discussion and also throughout the time, peri time period too. And the session is also being recorded and will be available to view later on the Hive's YouTube channel. And I'll link everything down below. So the Hive Think Tank is an ecosystem of thought leaders, uh, corporations, and entrepreneurs. We're an event and content platform with a focus on AI, 5G, blockchain, Web3, enterprise, health, and so much more. So we do host events almost every other week on cutting edge topics in technology and business. And we do publish uh, corresponding written piece thought pieces on Medium. So to stay in the know, for all of our events, make sure to join our meetup group and also follow our Medium page for content. And like I said, I'll link everything in the chat below. So with that, I will pass it over to Ravi to talk more about the Hive. Thank, thank you, Olivia. Um, so a uh, brief uh, overview of the Hive. The Hive is a venture fund. Uh, it's an early stage venture fund that uh, invests at pre-seed and seed stage. Um, everything we do leverages data and AI, and you see some of the areas that, that we are focused on, fintech, insurtech, enterprise. Enterprise is a broad area, includes um, security, DevOps, and, and other things, supply chain and health tech. Um, if you are an entrepreneur and uh, uh, looking to uh, raise money, um, please reach out to us. Uh, tmravi at hivedata.com. Next slide, please. Um, in addition to what we do in North America, we have separate entities in Brazil, Southeast Asia, India, and in the next six months or so in, in Europe and, and Saudi Arabia. So if you're an entrepreneur from, from another part of the world and want to get connected to our teams there, please do reach out to us. Next slide. Um, I, we are especially excited today uh, to, to mention uh, Nelson, who's, who's the global CTO of, uh, of TIPCO. Uh, he's coming out with a new book. I think it's on September 13th. Um, uh, Olivia, if you can post the, the Amazon link so, so that you guys, uh, all of you can, can pre-order it. And, and the focus of, of the book, so there's a lot that has been written around uh, blockchain. And, and so the focus of this book uh, is around blockchain and the enterprise. And, and Nelson will, will say more about that. Next slide, please. And so uh, the moderator of today's uh, uh, panel discussion will be my colleague and the chief product officer of the Hive, Kamesh Raghwendra. So I'll hand it over to you. Please use the Q&A button below to ask questions and, and Kamesh will, will bring them up as, as uh, he sees them. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks a lot for joining us today uh, in this panel discussion on the topic of the future of the enterprise and, and how decentralized it's getting. Um, this is a topic, obviously, which is close to all of us, uh, you know, being here, uh, part of the, uh, the Silicon Valley and, and the extended hive think tank around the world. Uh, the way we see businesses being built uh, change and shift year to year over the last five, seven years. Um, we have seen the impact of the sharing economy. We have seen the impact of gig work in the way we think about assets, the way we think about work in enterprises. Uh, we are also seeing shift in the way we sell our products, you know, from uh, uh, social media to ad tech to influencer to meme marketing. 
Um, so all these shifts have a common theme, which is things that used to be very uh, concentrated and centralized are very rapidly getting uh, disaggregated and decentralized. Um, and, and we have this panel today um, of two you know, kind of pioneering uh, uh, leaders in the space uh, who are working on technologies and, and kind of business structures um, that are affecting and, and changing the way we think about businesses. Uh, and incidentally, both our panelists today are dialing in from Canada, uh, which is an interesting theme <laughs> in today's panel. Um, so, so I'll uh, uh, happy to, you know, uh, glad to welcome our panelists to this discussion today. So we have uh, Nelson, who is the global CTO of TIPCO, joining us today, and we have uh, Andrew Polstra, uh, who is the head of research uh, at uh, Blockstream, one of our portfolio companies. Um, so, so uh, you know, I'll uh, hand it over to both Nelson and Andrew. Uh, for giving a quick introduction about what they're doing uh, and also their opening comments on this topic. Uh, also excited about Nelson's book that Ravi mentioned earlier. Uh, so look forward to learning more about uh, his upcoming book. Um, Nelson, why don't you go first and then we'll hand it over to Andrew. Sure. No, it sounds good. Thanks. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it, as was mentioned, I'm Nelson Petrachik, CTO for TIPCO Software, and uh, we are a uh, enterprise software company. Uh, deals uh, We deal with a lot of uh, different organizations across different verticals, uh, and we really handle in terms of uh, technology, in terms of moving data, managing data, analyzing data, uh, a lot of stuff to do with data. Um, and so one of the things that um, we often have uh, looked at is this problem around how ecosystems of organizations are actually building uh, these decentralized business networks and how business models are changing and how some of the technologies are also shifting around things like identity and, and what that means to the enterprise. And so a lot of the conversations I have with our customer base are around those types of topics. And that's why I'm excited to be here with Andrew today in the Hive. Um, and then the other reason, you know, this is actually the reason behind the book itself. Um, the book is more, it, it, it's not really geared towards blockchain, you know, people that live in that world uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, this is meant for people that are approaching uh, problems from an enterprise architecture standpoint and looking at, you know, where and if can blockchain or related blockchain technologies, um, where can it help with things like building these decentralized business networks? What does it mean to apply blockchain to the problem of identity? Uh, what does tokenization mean from an enterprise standpoint? Uh, th these kinds of topics, as well as some background in the technology and where it came from and uh, you know what's a consensus algorithm, what are different types and, and so on and so forth. So that's the nature of the book. So hopefully uh, some folks here on, on this particular session will, would find that useful. Uh, if so, feel free to go check it out. But um, you know, excited to be here, happy to be uh, talking about how blockchain is impacting or has the potential to impact uh, how organizations approach their, their business and, uh, and where they're going uh, in the future. So uh, with that, just a, that's a little bit of an intro of myself. Awesome. Thanks, Nelson. And I had an opportunity to uh, read a preview version of Nelson's book. Um, what particularly struck me was how direct it was. Uh, it was like blockchain for the busy business executive. Um, for those of you who just want to get to the brass tacks, to the meat of the point, uh, Nelson's book is a great way to get started on the journey of uh, adoption of not just technology, but the business models that come with it. Um, uh, Andrew would love to hear more about Blockstream and, and your kind of opening thoughts on this topic. Cool. Thanks so much. I just step away from the bus interchange here because there's a, a couple big machines running. So I'm, I'm Andrew Polstra. I'm the director of research at Blockstream and dialing in here from beautiful Burnaby, British Columbia at uh, Simon Fraser University back in the shade. I am the director of research at Blockstream. So Blockstream is a vertically integrated Bitcoin company is sort of the, the buzzword that we use. We have investments in mining. We have we actually have mining infrastructure, I should say. We've got a blockchain platform. We've got wallets. We've got financial instruments that we're trying to deploy on top of our platform and, and that our wallets can, can use and manipulate as we kind of build out this DeFi world. But the way that I think of Blockstream is that it's an applied cryptography company. So for... A bit of history and, and to maybe explain what that phrase means. Um, Blockstream was started in 2014 by a group of co-founders, most of whom were engineers and most of whom came from IRC, uh, from an IRC channel called Bitcoin Wizards, which is just a number of, of cryptography nerds just kind of fooling around with this. 
And a lot of us came from, not me, I was a little young, but a lot of us came from the cypherpunk history throughout the 90s of people trying to use cryptography to break down trust and to, um, I should say, break down requirements for trust and someone make the world less dependent on intermediaries and sensors and surveillance and, and things like this. And throughout all this time, there was kind of this holy grail of creating a currency somehow that didn't have a central issuer and that was not subject to the single point of failure problem where there was some single party who could be pressured to shut down, who was able to see all the transactions and stuff like that. And this problem was finally solved in, in late 2008, early 2009 by Bitcoin. And so by 2014, you know, you're still, we we're five or six years later, but we still, it felt somewhat like we'd finally climbed over this wall that we spent, you know, a decade trying to, to push through. And then we were just sort of blinking stupidly in the sun, trying to figure out like, where do we go from here, right? This is a whole brave new world of all these, these cryptographic opportunities where all of a sudden we have this asset, Bitcoin, that we can, can be controlled by scripting, can be controlled by smart contracts, can be controlled by cryptography. And what does that mean? Can you do micropayments? Can you do like things that look like derivatives? Can you have optionality? Can you have people who are, are directly being paid to produce content? Um, in these early days, we are already seeing the internet shift towards this kind of web two model where the users were kind of the, the product rather than the, the customer, where everything is monetized through ad click rates. Everything was monetized by kind of collecting user data, feeding this to large advertisers and building all the surveillance infrastructure, which is not at all what, what you know, the technicians trying to build the, the building blocks of this wanted to see. So we suddenly had this opportunity where maybe you could be a contract creator. Maybe you could be like a news website or a news org or something and be directly charging for the content that you're producing and so on. And so what we focused on, or what I focus on and, and Blockstream more generally, has been developing the cryptography here, developing privacy and scalability technology. And so to that end, we've got our platform, our blockchain platform called Liquid, which is a side chain of Bitcoin. You can move Bitcoin on, move Bitcoin off kind of thing. And we use that as a technology platform to develop the new tech that we're building. So we've developed confidential transactions, for example, which is something that you see in, in Monero and, and a few other blockchains out there where we have multiple assets on our blockchain and the transactions don't reveal what the assets are or what the amounts are. We've also developed things like Taproot, which got into Bitcoin. Taproot is a way for multiple participants who want to create a transaction to jointly produce it in a way that is indistinguishable from the perspective of blockchain verifiers, whether it's one person, an ordinary wallet, or maybe it's a number of people doing a, a more complex policy. It all looks like one key, one signature kind of thing. So it's more efficient and more private. Uh, and that, that was cool because usually privacy and scalability, you have to trade them off. But on that, we got a bit of a win. And we, we continue to push forward there, doing some things like assets that are, are very much our own, like separate from Bitcoin, and, uh, and a lot of stuff that are core technology components that we hope will get onto the Bitcoin blockchain itself, right, and be consistent with the Bitcoin ethos. Great, thanks. Thanks for the opening comments, Andrew. Um, and obviously, Bitcoin has come a long way uh, since its uh, uh, seminal white paper. Um, and it's it's great to see not just the community in the ecosystem mature, but the rest of the world uh, and the changes that have happened in the way people consume, in the way people organize themselves, um, all aligning in a in a very fortuitous way. Um, to be more ready to adopt a technology uh, like Bitcoin or, or the underlying technologies um, that, that make up the whole community. Um, as uh, Andrew was describing, uh, I'm sure most of you caught that, you know, there is a whole kind of stack of applications that are, that are coming up um, and, and what is usually called as layer two and layer three, um, which means that the, the power of, of not having to trust one another, but being able to do reliable transactions um, and also without needing a trusted third party, um, this primitive, this underlying uh, kind of power the technology gives us leads to a number of applications, which is usually described as layer two. Um, and, and in that layer, uh, we are seeing uh, alignment with, you know, like the examples that uh, uh, Andrew was giving around creator economy, um, uh, the way uh, people buy, the way people engage uh, with uh, not just brands and enterprises, but also social influencers and, and communities that are coming up. Um, and, and these types of uh, communities uh, of, of users uh, who are relying on this underlying, uh, you know, trustless, scalable technology, um, these communities together are, are creating, you know, what is usually called Web3 
Um, and again, these are uh, very uh, amorphous terms uh, and the actual definition and what they will become um, are, are being built as we speak. Um, and we will see the outcomes of, of you know number of these communities and what applications they're developing. We'll see those outcomes in the, in the course of the coming years. Um, um, but just on the topic of the technology, the underlying technology, uh, you know, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's um, Ethereum-based uh, communities, um, would love to sense the, uh, you know, the sentiment of the audience through a short poll, uh, especially in the light of the recent market conditions. Uh, Olivia, maybe you can bring up the poll um, and see how the uh, audience is feeling, uh, you know, whether they're thinking uh, long or they're thinking short. Uh, you know, just from a pure market dynamic standpoint, and let's see what the sentiment of the audience is. Um, but maybe you know, while we while we measure uh, you know the the <laughs> the audience sentiment here, um, we can we can dive into the you know the first topic that uh, Andrew alluded to. Uh, you know, this this notion of the creator economy um, and how people get influenced and how people consume uh, products and services. Um, so obviously, you know, anybody uh, tracking Facebook's uh, and some of the other kind of uh, uh, Web two uh, platforms performance. Uh, would have seen that there is a there is a shift happening uh, in the world, uh, you know, from traditional kind of attention economy ad tech uh, based uh, web two platforms uh, to other platforms. And as uh, kind of younger consumers come into the economy, especially the Gen, Gen Z and Gen Alpha generation of consumers, um, we are seeing quite a bit of shift uh, in the way people uh, buy, people do commerce. Uh, ah, there you go. <laughs> Although I expected uh, a bit more uh, boost on the 100k, <laughs> but it's still positive overall. Um, so, so, so therefore, we are seeing a shift in the way uh, consumption is getting decentralized. Uh, and and today, if you talk to any brand, uh, it's not just sufficient to you know just push ads uh, on a Facebook or a search ad on Google. Um, they need to engage with creators, they need to engage with social influencers, um, they need to be part of the earned media, they need to earn their way uh, into being part of the uh, conversations happening uh, out there online. Um, and, and this is the, the fundamental kind of shift uh, from the attention economy to the creator economy. Um, and particularly in this shift, uh, what is really changing is, is how uh, enterprises even identify their customers. It's no longer the traditional kind of you know central CRM and you know you have a, a complete kind of direct access uh, to to end customers uh, you just track them everywhere and push ads and and sell products um, it's become a lot more complex uh, because you need to understand how the consumer uh, is is forming a community which social influencer is having an impact on the consumer's thinking um, and also uh, you know andrew pointed a lot uh, of privacy and and kind of technologies that protect the identity of the consumer um, so all this boils down to from an enterprise's standpoint uh, what is the future of the consumer's identity um, so maybe we can start with uh, nelson uh, he also alluded to this topic in his opening comments um, and then and then uh, swing back to andrew Sure. Well, that sounds good. Yeah, that's that's a lot to start with all right out of the gate. Uh, but but you're right. I mean, even from a, a lot of the enterprise customers that we talk to, um, they are having to now navigate this new this new world, this new way of interacting with their customers, uh, and the way in which their customers can directly influence through a, a very vast network and do so quite quickly. Um, the impact that one one influencer can have on whether or not an organization actually sells a, a certain product, um, or you know, reputation uh, becomes a big factor in this as well. And you see that with all the ESG initiatives, and so so there's that that whole space has really changed the way that organizations uh, market. Uh, and engage with their customers, and, and you're right. It's uh, that 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 world is now, uh, you know, in many ways more entrepreneurial. It's it's an opportunity now for them to actually participate in multiple income streams. And there's all these to earn uh, mechanisms, whether it's play to earn, where to earn. Uh, there's even one around. If it's I think it's move to earn is what you'll call it, right? For health and and wellness. So so there's all these other streams now that people are using 
to uh, create economies and to create communities. And so as, as the enterprises that I deal with, and this is a, this is a true regardless of vertical, um, the topic of identity becomes then very, very critical. How do you identify who it is that you're interacting with and marketing to and eventually selling hopefully products and services to and do so in a way that respects these communities, um, builds the right sort of reputations, and also uh, enables you to maintain certain, you know, what people are, are now really focused on around things like privacy and security. And so I, the notion of identity is becoming completely different. It, it's no longer the case where uh, I freely give my identity to, you know, I, we'll, we'll pick on all the social media companies probably a few times in this particular discussion, but I don't give my identity freely to them and then they take all my data and monetize it and I have no control over it. People do not want that. They, they want to keep control of their own identity. Um, the internet was actually not designed to manage identity. And so you need to actually look at, well, how can I layer in identity systems on top of this thing called the internet and do so in a way that as an individual, I can control my own identity freely and kind of have the power to say who has what of my information for what purpose and then be able to revoke it which is very, very difficult to do today with a lot of these systems. Once my identity is gone, it's in a database somewhere and that, that firm will use it and they'll use it however they want to. So this notion of identity, and you'll hear terms like self-sovereign identity or uh, just, just digital identity, just bringing identity back in the hands of the individual so that I have more control over it. I can control who can see what. Uh, I can partially disclose certain elements and parts of my identity so I don't have to disclose everything to everybody. Uh, and, you know, I can monetize then aspects of that, which I may not be able to uh, today. And that goes back now to the creator economy and, and these new formations of communities and how I'm going to acquire and, and participate in all these different streams of income. So enterprises are really concerned about this. And blockchain is one possible mechanism. It's not the only, um, but it's one possible mechanism by which I can help to achieve this, this kind of blending, if you will, of give an identity back in the control of the consumer uh, and yet providing or showcasing that I can provide enough value to them that they will then choose to then give me some elements of their, their data, their identity. And remember, identity is more than just a name. It's my friends, it's my behaviors. Identity is quite broad. So there's elements there that are valuable. And if I'm receiving valuable services in return, then maybe I can choose to give up certain elements of my identity. So you, you see that in the market. Uh, I have a whole chapter in my book on it, but uh, you know, there's um, the W3C is looking at this. There's the Trust Over IP uh, organization that's looking at this. The Linux Foundation is looking at this. Uh, this this problem of identity is really shifted, and uh, organizations have to really focus on how they're going to address that when it comes to marketing their goods and services. Awesome, thanks, Nelson. What really stuck with me was the internet is not designed to manage your identities, uh, and and you know we spend so much of our time on the internet, which is you know, not really designed uh, for the kind of blind trust we mm -hmm. usually put on the on the uh, people we are interacting with online. So, Andrew, while you comment on the topic of identity, it would be great if you could also tee us off into the world of Web three and how you see the internet's evolution into Web three. Um, and it looks like the question of identity is 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 one of the topics that it addresses. Yeah, um, so that, that was a great answer by Nelson, really describing the problem that needs to be solved and, and also the observation that the internet was not designed to solve this kind of problem. And going back to let me give a bit more of a more technical history here, right? Throughout the 90s, these cypherpunks trying to develop money, trying to, to figure out how to be sovereign on the internet. Um, that was, I guess, the other holy, holy grail, right? Was how can you have some sort of decentralized identity? And there are various cryptographic proposals, things like brands, credentials, and, and things of this nature that were able to solve some of the technical problems, but it ultimately grounded out is, is how do you attach these keys to a person? How do you deal with the fact that their, their privacy losses can be permanent? How can you deal with the fact that you don't really know that there's no connection to, between the internet and, and a human being? And any attempt to create one runs the risk of creating some irreversible damage, right? Where there's a privacy loss to a human being, and then you can't undo that because you somehow attach them to the internet. How do you trade that off against having no connection? And um, and then you you the benefits of having an identity, the benefits of knowing who you're talking to, um, knowing when it's the same person you're talking to, and and where they're coming from, and what they want, and stuff. How can you get that? And 
I remember in the early days of Blockstream, our then CTO, um, so we were talking about identity, like should we try to do some sort of identity product or figure out a solution here? And our then CTO, Greg Maxwell, said no. He said, identity is a feces covered spike upon which a litany of companies have piled themselves. And it was, I'm, I'm sorry, but it was such a vivid uh, uh, illustration. <laughs> we, we all laughed and then, and then decided not to, uh, not to tackle that head on. But what's interesting is that Bitcoin actually we, we didn't realize it at the time, but there's sort of a way in which um, Bitcoin and then later tokenomics, Web3 and, and stuff kind of gave us an answer to the question of how do we approach this, right? And so what Bitcoin did, one of the novel things that Bitcoin did is that rather than trying to associate keys with people, Bitcoin associated the keys with money. So if you own some money, then what that means is that you've got the secret key that can be used to spend that. But the key is actually attached to the money itself, right? The, the key is not attached to you. The, the only way that you're connected is do you have physical possession of the keys? You know, do you have a hardware wallet? Do you have a computer? Or do you have, do you have that information? And that's not something that anybody else needs to know or verify or, or whatever. Um, and if they do, you can produce signatures and so on. But the human connection is now something very ephemeral, right? It's what do I have? What am I holding? I can give that away. I can go deal with kind of the real world, my real world understanding of possession to deal with the legalities and privacy implications and things of that nature. And so in the early days, when we were thinking about what will the world like look like with Bitcoin, we were thinking about payment flows, right? We were thinking about like, you can publish an article and get paid per word, right? Or you can like be running a Tor node and be paid for byte, per byte on all of the data that you're running through. Or you can be streaming a movie and you can pay per byte or per frame or whatever as a movie's coming in and so on. And we were just thinking of payment flows for, for objects. And an interesting development is sort of the, this notion of tokenomics, where rather than just having money and sort of people receiving or sending money in traditional corporations and things like that, you now can extend this notion of attaching a key to a, a UTXO or a key to a, to a pot of money and say, well, this key is now going to represent, it's just going to be a free floating object here. It's going to represent an NFT, okay? It's just a token. It has a key associated to it. There's only one of it, all right? And what I'm going to do is if I want to produce something, I'm going to then attach the thing that I produced to that original key and the payment flows will go through that original key. And so now I'm able to create an object that's independent of me, but which nonetheless is able to be connected to different things that I'm creating and different payment flows that I might want to have. And if I want to shift my identity or if I want to create something new, I can create new keys, I can route money through them. And this not only gives us hope for, for you know, dealing with identity because we can build things up kind of like one piece at a time, right? Starting just with money and then with a token that represents payment flows and then with something that's, that's more interesting. It gives us a hope for solving the privacy issues because all of these keys are things that we can hopefully we can ground out and say physical possession or, or things that are more ephemeral. And it also introduces new capabilities that we never really envisioned at the time where I can do something collaboratively with my friends and create a token that then represents, say, different percentage ownerships between the, the multitude of us. And we can have different payment flows that are split up in different proportions, and then those are re-split up, and so on. And so we can create these relationships, and we can embed them, and we can attach you know, token flows and payment flows to those while they're still ephemeral, and they're incredibly flexible. So it's really it's, it's, it's quite an interesting thing to see. And it seems like that's sort of where, where the world is going, and this what we call Web3 as sort of this attempt to build up infrastructure around that and try to figure out yeah. what can we build with this, this new idea. Awesome, thanks, Andrew. I think the concept of, instead of tagging individuals uh, with identity, tagging value uh, with the right secure infrastructure uh, so that individuals are attached to tagged pieces of value, whether it's financial assets, whether it's data assets, whether it is other forms of, uh, you know, like loyalty and, and relationship type of assets. Um, and then the ident the person it's himself or herself is is not tethered uh, to the to the internet. I think that's a that's a powerful way of uh, and a very alternate way of thinking about uh, not just privacy and security, but also uh, uh, quantification of value uh, built and created online. Um, and particularly going further on this topic, uh, uh, Nelson would also you know, love to hear your thoughts on the Web3 um, and particularly how you see traditional uh, services in real world, you know, like financial services, uh, other forms of uh, uh, services we consume every day. Um, how do you see those services uh, 
changing or evolving um, as they become part of uh, you know this new generation of internet that we call web3 yeah i mean i think uh, so uh, or, or enterprises a lot of the organizations again that we talk to often ask about i've heard about this nft thing somebody sold a ton of art for millions of dollars what does that mean for me right i mean that's that's what they hear from the news that that's kind of where uh, where they come at it from and i think if you distill it down to the element of programmability and so you can actually associate logic with some some asset, some could even be fractional ownership, some instrument, some whatever that is, it's the element of programmability that then makes it interesting for an enterprise because you can actually now embed in code the logic that you're going to use to associate value with a particular asset or uh, you know you can open up things like fractional ownership which can then improve overall liquidity in a system or you know, whatever this is is the programmability aspect and element that is actually then from an enterprise standpoint quite interesting and so identity then becomes programmable um, uh, you've got this much more decentralized mechanism by which uh, assets and the ownership of those assets may be then represented and shared uh, and then you can trace uh, the kind of track and trace that, if you will, throughout a, a complete decentralized business network of multiple participants and so on, right? To throw the, all the buzzwords into one single sentence, I'm sure. But it's, it's that element of programmability that people are really looking at. Now, it's interesting because you look at it from two different points of view, though. Um, the one element here is, is the user experience. So for a end user who's not technical, let's say, so a variety of people are out there in the world, what does that mean to them, right? Their, their quote unquote wallet becomes the interface into this new Web3 world, this new decentralized world, this world of programmable assets, whatever that is. I need, you know, my that interface is my wallet, right? It's something that where I hold, store, keep my keys. Up until now, that's been challenging for a lot of people to actually consume. And so one of the problems we're going to have to solve as people move and adopt and further get into the different services that are offered in this Web3 world is that interface. How do they interact with these systems? Uh, and so that, that's sort of at the top of the stack. On, on, if you flip it around and look at it from a technology standpoint, your challenge is going to be in Web3, there's a lot more moving pieces currently. And so whether you're looking at all the different, you, I mean, you mentioned all the different protocols that sit on top of things like Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatnot, then you got bridges between them all. Uh, then you've got how you store the data. People will throw out all the oracles. There's a lot more moving pieces to this Web3 architecture that still have yet to be uh, you know, fully defined, solidified, uh, interoperable, uh, standardized, you know, whatever that is. So that, that's the other part of the challenge that when an enterprise looks at this problem and says, where and how can I step into this world of, you know, transitioning from Web 2 to Web 3 and so on? Uh, you know, where, where are the gotchas? And, and these are just a couple of them that, uh, that people often talk about. And so, you know, you, there's, there's definite value to the paradigm, but, uh, you know, we, we have to make sure that as we're moving towards this state of Web 3 and everything that it enables, uh, you know, how do we take a traditional organization and convert that if you will to follow and adopt a lot of those principles and so that this is interesting it's an interesting blend there's this push pull that goes on and uh it, you know it's um in some ways it, or certain organizations is probably just going to bypass and they'll never catch up right and and those ones will live or not and and you know life will go on right but uh, and you'll see new organizations emerge then that have caught up, but it, it's an interesting mix, uh, the way the technology is playing out and, and how enterprises need to think about it. Absolutely, Nelson. and we've always seen consumers lead the way and, and business organizations uh, always end up playing the catch-up game. Um, and, and talking about uh, you know organizations, the, the mother of all organizations, which is the government, uh, and there's a question about <laughs> how the government uh, looks at this you know, from Clay here. Um, especially around uh, you know this notion of control and and self sovereignty of of the citizen um, and and this tension between uh, you know the the security and and the welfare of of the entire group of citizens versus the individual's uh, sense of sovereignty um, and it, this question is probably more fundamental than than just the technology or just Web three um, and I'm sure you know civilizations have grappled uh, with this question and 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 what we have today our current democratic system is the best we've been able to come up with uh, over the millennia. 
Um, so, so would love to hear opinions from both of uh, your sides. And I'm, I'm sure Andrew, you would have uh, dealt with this up and close. You know, as uh, Bitcoin has gone through several uncertain, certain, semi-certain regimes of regulation or attempts to <laughs> regulate. Um, and, and Nelson, obviously, I'm sure, uh, you know, as a thought leader, uh, uh, thinking about this technology, regulation is definitely part of that. So while we answer this question with uh, Andrews and Nelson's help, uh, we also have a poll question. Uh, we've spoke a lot about the creator economy. Uh, would love to see the sentiment uh, within the audience uh, around their interaction with the creator economy. Um, just the topic of social influencers and, and how you guys have interacted and been influenced in the recent past with social influencers. So while we get this uh, audience poll, um, Andrew and Nelson would love to hear your thoughts on the US government in particular, but overall kind of government-based regulations and how they impact the evolution of Web3. Sure, so I, I can go first um, and I'll, I'll try to be brief because I, I think we could easily spend more than the entire hour um, trying to yes. explore this question. Um, but I mean, you touched on this, Kamesh, that, um, that I mean, this is a big question that the societies have grappled with for quite a while. Um, and I guess one thing that I'll say is that there's a, a meme in this space that there's sort of a, a libertarian undercurrent throughout a lot of the cryptocurrency space that views the, the United States government very negatively and, and sort of assumes a, a um, sort of a character of it, where it's always in a way against self-sovereignty is against control, is against privacy, is pro-surveillance and, and things like that. Um, and this isn't entirely true, right? So as one simple example, the way the US dollar works. So every, every bill has a serial number on it, right? And, and in theory, you can use this bill for, for tracing dollar flows in, in trucks and you know trying to follow crimes and money laundering and things like this. But in fact, it's illegal in the United States for individual merchants to use a serial number of that bill and refuse to take money, right? All the money is the same. All the money is legal tender, at least for the purpose of ordinary transaction. And I know there's a lot of nuance to that, but right, and, and the way that it's actually expressed in the law, but that is a deliberate law. And the deliberate goal of that, the understanding behind that is that if the United States dollar is not fungible, then it's not useful as a currency, right? The fungibility means a dollar is a dollar, they're all interchangeable. But fungibility is very closely related to privacy, right? Because how could a dollar not be fungible? So, I mean, if we had like specie money, maybe you could like assay it and like some of them have more silver than, than others or whatever. But for paper money, the way it fails to be fungible is, is through its transaction history, right? The way that it fails to be fungible is if you think a dollar has been used for bad things, if it has too much blood or cocaine on it or whatever, then you shouldn't accept it. And we have explicit laws and historical precedent going back, you know, well over a century to, to make sure that this isn't the case, to make sure that these dollars are fungible. So where we see concern from the government, where we see these anti-privacy things is in my experience, what it typically looks like are lawmakers who are maybe being informed by law enforcement or being informed by investigators who are concerned about losing their ability to see, see different payment flows and stuff. And lawmakers who don't understand the technolo technological shift here in that with Bitcoin, your choices are not you know, these flows exist and the government can access them with a subpoena or whatever, or they're, they're gone and, and nobody can access them. But if Bitcoin is closer to everybody knows everything or only the individual transactors know what's going on, right? So our goals when we're talking about Bitcoin privacy and, and privacy more generally in the web free space is how can we transact with each other in a way that the transactors know what's going on? And maybe they have to keep audit logs, maybe they're subject to laws, whatever, but they know what's going on, but they don't have to publish to the entire world that what they're doing is, or exactly what they're doing. They do have to publish to the world that what they're doing is legit, that they're not creating money out of thin air, that they're not moving money that they don't own, that they're not you know, breaking crypto signatures and stuff. We do want this notion of public verifiability and we want transparency in that sense. But what we don't want to reveal is all of our, all of our um, financial details. And that's something that lawmakers understand when you when you explain it to them and say, well, this isn't you know about whether the FBI can tell what you're spending. This is whether when you buy something, does the American government know and the government of China and the government of Russia and they know it forever and like some other other threatening entity that maybe doesn't even exist today will be able to go back and see that history. That's very concerning, but that's sort of the default in a publicly verifiable network, and that's sort of what we're trying to avoid, and that's a goal that governments, including the American government, but, but also others can get behind and they can understand, right? But naturally, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult goal to understand because it's unprecedented. 
And there's obviously a trade-off there between their law enforcement capabilities. And there obviously are parts of the government that are not really interested in, in the functioning of society beyond can they do their jobs and catch criminals, right? And they obviously have, have a very strong presence and, and they argue forcefully in the other direction. But the government as a whole is not of one mind and it understands our goals or, or some parts of the government understand our goals, I think. So there's room for optimism there. Absolutely. And I think to your point, in, in a perfect world where the rules of law are just black and white, uh, where an algorithmically verified compliance is, is objectively good enough and you can just publish it to all countries out there. Um, I, think, I think the reality that we live in is not that perfect. There is a lot of subjective discretion that enforcement agencies have and need to enforce law because the laws are not as black and white uh, as a smart contract would, would like to have it. Um, and the enforcement agencies therefore need subjective discretion. Um, and, and that's where I think, you know, the, the you know, kind of perceived conflict uh, between a utopian black and white enforcement versus a, a real world kind of subjective opinion based discretionary enforcement, um, that power that enforcement agencies needs. Um, blockchain as a technology is just too puristic. Uh, and I think that's, in my opinion, the, the perception of, of conflict. Um, and there's also a question that Geraldine asks here, um, which is especially around KYC, uh, which is what is the uh, the fiduciary or the uh, custodial role of an enterprise uh, engaging with a consumer? Um, and obviously, the in in several uh, types of financial services, the law uh, requires the enterprise to know certain things uh, about the identity and, and other factors of the transaction with the consumer. Um, and, and does this, again, conflict uh, you know, with the more kind of black and white type of open uh, compliance that, that blockchain as a technology offers? Um, maybe we can hear some uh, thoughts from Nelson and I'll switch back to you after that, Andrew. Uh, Nelson, maybe you can include the KYC angle in your, in your comments. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you made a good point when you talked about there, there's a gray area. Uh, again, going back to the programmability aspect uh, of these networks and of Web3 services and so on, uh, not everything could be represented in code. Uh, you know, there's um, there's a great article by uh, Nick Zabo and, and Miguel, a uh, gentleman on my team who's uh, also very passionate about the topic of blockchain, pointed me to this. But it's it, it's really, um, you know, he talks a lot about what can be represented and interpreted by the computer and what has to be represented and interpreted by the brain. And so you can't put everything as it stands today in code. Uh, and he also goes on to say that there won't be this magic uh, switch, if you will, where all of a sudden AI becomes all knowing uh, overnight and it just you know takes over from that point forward. But there'll be bits and pieces that maybe it does, but not everything all at one shot. Uh, but, but there is this idea of not everything can be put in code. And so there is a more subjective or an element of just contracts, if you will, um, that are more interpreted. Uh, let's say by you know the, currently the court systems and, and things like that. And I know uh, we're going to get into the use of this kind of programmability, this decentralized concept as it pertains to actually uh, DAOs and, and running an organization itself. But just generally speaking, from an enterprise standpoint, um, I, uh, you, there is there needs to be an awareness of what is currently managed, governed, uh, required uh, by you know, regulatory bodies and so on. And this gets into KYC. Uh, which can help with things like anti-money uh, laundering um, requirements, uh, even GDPR, you know, how, the right to be forgotten. Uh, if you can't delete, then how, do you, how are you forgotten? So, so there's certain considerations like that that organizations have to be uh, aware of. So yeah, there, it, not everything can be put into code. And so there's still going to be that element, at least as it exists today, of a third party or somebody that is going to help interpret what is part of that that Web3 environment um, that an organization may partake in today. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and while we're talking about reorganizing businesses and how some of these technologies are changing the way uh, people build businesses, build companies, um, maybe we can go around the panel and talk about some examples of uh, you know, what we are seeing around us. Um, especially, you know, uh, in the venture capital industry, um, we are seeing a lot of uh, DAO, decentralized autonomous organization based pooling of capital, uh, making uh, decentralized voting based investment decisions and deployment of capital. 
um, where the the uh, the fee structure, uh, the way capital moves, uh, the way the profits or the capital gains uh, are shared, uh, they are all pegged to token economics, um, and therefore the LPs, you know, the limited partners, quote unquote, uh, are are owners of a particular type of token. Um, those tokens uh, peg the investments, the uh, you know the cryptocurrencies that are. Um, uh, you know, uh, invested in, in in you know individual companies or individual DAOs, uh, and therefore there is this investment DAO uh, that pushes tokens uh, into individual kind of business uh, DAOs, uh, and then the token economics are are uh, kind of uh, realized by pegging back value all the way to the original token that the LP holds, uh, you know, which is kind of the structure that's coming up here. Um, and uh, you know, Ravi and I, we have seen uh, a number of uh, such VC DAOs and, and they're being quite active, um, especially over the pandemic years, you know, with all the excitement around Web3, NFTs, Layer 2 uh, applications and, and whatnot. Um, so I would love to uh, uh, kind of hear uh, your uh, kind of experiences in, in building this and obviously Blockstream, Andrew, uh, you know, we've seen use cases in, in energy, we've seen use cases in uh, traditional financial services, we're seeing use cases in retail payments. Um, and Nelson, as uh, you know, given that you work with so many uh, broad spectrum of, you know, in large enterprises and how they are thinking um, about uh, these new models of, of reorganization of their business. Um, and Clay also mentions a, a particular book uh, that he feels could have, uh, you know, a lot of motivation for us. I've heard of this book, Snow Crash, I haven't read it myself. If either of you uh, have read it, uh, you know, would love to uh, see your kind of correlation with that book and what you're seeing out there. Uh, and Nelson, there's a book. There's a question about your book. I'm sure you'll take that question when you <laughs> when you answer and 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 uh, pass your comment. So maybe Andrew, we can start with you and then switch over to Nelson. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll be quick because I actually I don't know a lot about this, and I, I don't know that anybody knows a lot about how the world's going to look in the next five or or ten years uh, as these kind of technologies come in. Like certainly, we see kind of like traditional decentralization in the sense of like, I work at Blockstream remotely. I have for the last six years. We've never had, uh, I guess we had an office, but we've never had the majority of our employees going to a single office or being in a single country or, or even in a single state of the US. Um, and so in that sense, we, we've always been decentralized. And then going a little bit further, we've had contractors who would come on, who would join us for a project. We would send them some Bitcoin. They, they often would just like request to be paid in Bitcoin. And the, and the payment was very straightforward. And as a business, we, we were nonetheless required to do certain amounts of, of due diligence and KYC, you know, make sure that they're not in Iran or, or something like that, or at least, you know, they, they were not, they were not uh, sending money across any borders that we're not supposed to cross. As an individual, though, I've done the same thing and where like, I'll do a little, like maybe I'll see if their IP address is not obviously somewhere crazy. But I remember once I was working on the compiler for the Rust programming language and I ran into a, a missing feature in the compiler. And I just went on IRC and I said, hey, can somebody please implement this feature? I'll give you a Bitcoin, right? And then Bitcoin was worth a bit less at the time. Um, and it wound up being, you know, a day or two of work for someone. And I sent them the coin. I don't know who they were, right? I mean, I just had an IRC handle. I gave them the coin. You know, they did the work. The work is in the compiler, um, which is pretty cool. And I was like, wow, that really, that really solved the problem for me, right? And then... But going forward, I can imagine maybe what, what if it wasn't a human on the other side, right? What if I was dealing with something like a DAO? What if I was dealing with something more mechanical, right? Like a, a, some sort of automatic market maker or, or um, something of that nature. Or maybe there's a financial service that I want. Or maybe there's something that can be provided completely automatically where I'm able to send money to them and they're able to provide me a service. And that interaction is actually um, um, like in, using bearer instruments in a way similar to a real world like vending machine interaction, but one where the entity that I'm interacting with can be ephemeral or can even like not be a well-defined entity in, in the traditional sense. Um, and I'll stop there so I don't babble, but it's, it'll be interesting to see what this looks like. Well, I love the story, the Bitcoin code. So I'm sure right now that code is platinum. It's worth a lot more <laughs> than you paid for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nelson would love to hear your comments on this. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm sure there was a heck of a feature then in the compiler. Uh, the, um, uh, so some of the conversations that we have, you know, organizations, again, it's interesting because right now in traditional enterprises, a lot of the power is kind of centralized, right? There's a small group of individuals within an organization that are making the decisions. And so there's this interesting 
match or mismatch, maybe impedance mismatch between wanting to be or wanting to have that power be more distributed, let's say, and decentralized and allow more people to participate in a decision making process. But traditionally, that hasn't always been the case. And so how do you how do you break that barrier? And so what we've seen in some enterprise use cases is more if I'm going to build a, I'm going to call it a, for lack of a better phrase at the moment, a, a virtual enterprise, right? An enterprise that consists of uh, different organizations to provide some broader service. Uh, you know, maybe there's elements there that I could treat as a, a DAO, right? Something that's much more, let's say, automated, where you're there is no traditional hierarchy. You're your, um, you know, people people contribute, if you will, or, or acquire governance tokens, and then based on how many tokens you have and how long you have them, maybe that kind of gives you a bit of a level of participation within this virtual organization. Uh, you know, the way the rules are governed, the way that external parties interact is automated again because you can codify a lot of that. Those tend to be, at least again in this context, right, with traditional enterprise customers, um, that tends to be where the discussion around this decentralized business network, this this DAO in essence, uh, starts to come into play, and and then you bring in all the all the pieces that might support that. Right? So all the all the different Web three elements come into play here. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, networks such as Bitcoin come into play here. Uh, the different protocols that sit on top uh, come into play so that you can communicate more directly between two parties and then settle everything down to the main chain. Those kinds of conversations then start to come up. Um, but on the, on the flip side, you're, I mean, there's, there's, it's not all advantages when it comes to creating a DAO. Um, even things like how long do you have to wait for a decision to actually go through? Uh, you know, on a, on a network, if you're waiting for the decision to go through, according to all the participants that have to agree upon a decision, that can take some time. It's not as simple as just making a decision in a boardroom and away you go. So there's there's certain things like that that one needs to consider as well. And I think once those benefits start to become more realized and people understand that there's more benefits than there's are you know, disadvantages, then you might start to see more of these structures start to emerge, not just with you know DeFi and, and some of these other areas in which we're seeing them today, but uh, also within the more quote unquote traditional enterprise, if you will. Absolutely. And Clay, just to answer your question, I haven't thought about an audible version. Uh, I mean, I can barely speak Canadian English, so I might have to think about that, though. <laughs> Nelson, this is the effect of your voice. After hearing your voice, there's demand for an audible book. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, I think there was a question for you as well from Clay uh, about, you know, Blockstream considering decentralized compute. I think you, you do have uh, you know, a whole kind of decentralized network for mining. Uh, I think he's talking about just yep. uh, things beyond right. mining. Just... Yeah, yeah, compute in general. So decentralized compute. Um, what a what a fun question. So for a, a little bit of, of CS background behind decentralized compute, the, the way that sort of traditionally, the, the way that uh, <laughs> um, boot time, um, the way that um, Compute is done sort of in the Ethereum network in Solana and, and through various Web3 projects has been essentially that you take some some ordinary computer code, right, where you're, you're sort of stepping through various instructions and you're accomplishing some sort of goal and you are running it on a decentralized computer. And, and what's meant by that, right, is you're distributing the code. Everybody runs it individually, kind of checks that they got the same results, right? And then uh, assuming they all agree on the result, then the state of the chain has changed somehow and, and moved forward. But what is actually so there there are two problems with this. so one is scalability right it's very you take an ordinary computation and you just do it you know hundreds or thousands of times and that's that gets pretty uh pretty rough pretty quickly but the other issue or maybe not not an issue is that it's not necessary what the actual goal is in having all these computers do these computations is that they can somehow verify that the result of the computation is correct so what we're doing at blockstream we're developing sort of two pieces of technology that, that hopefully we'll start to see. Um, one, simplicity, is, um, is a, a contract uh, programming language. And we'll start to see that by the end of the year, we should have that deployed somewhere, at least so you can play with it in, in test networks, and, and, or at least on your own local reg test. And the way the simplicity works is that it's designed to verify the result of computation. So, so simplicity is not Turing complete, but you could write, you could execute kind of an arbitrary program. You could do an arbitrary program execution and verify that the execution gave the correct result 
using simplicity. So it's fully general for verification. It's not fully general for execution. And from a technical standpoint, right, that means something very obscure, right, that we don't have unbounded loops. Um, but from a practical standpoint, that introduces some very interesting, there are this way of thinking, maybe you can take up some interesting directions. So as an example of that, the other piece of technology that you're not going to see this year, um, but hopefully next year or maybe the year after, is we're working on something called zero knowledge proofs. And what zero knowledge proofs are cryptographically, is there a way to accomplish this goal, to do some sort of computation, to get a result and verify that the result is what you expected or what it needed to be. But you do it without revealing anything about the computation. So an example of that, one of the, the early toy examples of this, is that it's possible to solve a Sudoku puzzle and prove that you know a solution to the puzzle, proves that you know that you don't have repeated a number in any row or column or square or whatever, but you don't actually reveal what the solution is. So if you're claiming to solve something, but you don't want to give away the answer, you can use this Sudoku zero knowledge proof protocol and there, there, thereby prove that what you're doing is uh, was actually a Sudoku. And the curious thing is that verifying the result is significantly faster than if you were to do the verification, if you were to check every number yourself. Somehow we get this, this benefit of privacy and it comes as a benefit of scalability. We're able to compress very large amounts of computation into very small transcripts. And, uh, and that's a very exciting thing, but this is really uh, kind of bleeding edge cryptography, the kind of stuff that we're working on. This is a technology that's deployed in Zcash. Um, Zcash is able to do pretty much basic peer-to-peer -peer transactions. And despite the simplicity of what they're doing, you know, it still takes you know, a, a minute or so to do some of these computations on your computer to actually produce these proofs. And it, it's probably not practical on a battery-based small device or something. So, I mean, this is bleeding edge stuff. It's getting better and better, but that's the kind of direction that Blockstream is trying to go in. And, uh, and so we hope that by combining this, this kind of verification first model of simplicity and, and our direct programming language work, that we'll be able to transition into the zero knowledge version of that in the future uh, and thereby get even better scalability and, and privacy. But, uh, but as I said, the, like the, the very basic building blocks here are still very new. Um, it's like the paper being, papers being published, you know, multiple times a week now that are all doing really exciting stuff that, that wasn't possible a year ago. So, so that's the way that we think at Blockstream. Awesome, thanks, Andrew. A lot of very useful leading edge information. So maybe with that, we can, we can wrap up this panel discussion. Um, thanks a lot uh, to both our guests, uh, Nelson and Andrew, uh, for sharing all their insights and, and helping us navigate through this is quite a cluttered topic of blockchain, Web3, and, and the future of uh, organizing businesses. Um, um, so you know, look forward to continuing this conversation and this engagement. Um, uh, maybe you know, I could give a minute to both uh, Andrew and Nelson if they have any closing comments, uh, something that they've noticed or some nuance that they feel we should all uh, you know, keep our eyes on um, before handing it back over to Olivia. Um, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, yeah, I mean, as, as I sort of hinted at multiple times here, there's some new technologies and new concepts, new ideas of how we think about cash flows and how we think about tokens and how we think about identity and how we think about the way that we relate to each other and society and businesses and corporations um, that are all very new. And it's very open-ended and unclear. You know, I, I talked about at the start when, when Bitcoin started, we sort of like burst through this wall and we're sort of blinking at the sky saying like, what do we do now that we've got this decentralized money? Well, here we are starting to do much more interesting stuff. And we've, I guess, just broken through another wall to an even brighter room. And, uh, and I guess we'll need a bit longer for our eyes to adjust. Indeed. Yeah, no, definitely. There, there's, uh, there's going to be a few walls, I think, that get broken over the next few years. So it, it's definitely an exciting time. I mean, I think, uh, you know, one, just like any new technology, uh, there's always um, uh, the marketing buzz around it, let's say, and then you want to make sure that you're not, uh, there's there's the reality aspect of it as well. You know, when I'm talking to enterprises, you have to make sure that you're kind of blending those two sides together, but um, it is extremely exciting. I mean, I, I do recommend uh, for any of my customers that I'm talking to that this is something that they track because this is not so much a matter of, you know, if something is going to happen around this technology, it's more a matter of when and how. And, uh, and we're starting to see it already, whether, whether they're aware of it or not. So, um, so my recommendation is, you know, at the very least, organizations should be tracking it. 
and uh, and looking to see when and how it might be applicable to what it is that they do because it otherwise they're going to get blindsided by it awesome thank you guys thanks for joining us olivia back to you well thank you so much andrew and nelson for joining us kamesh for being a great moderator and everyone else for joining um we'll get this session uploaded onto youtube and then i will send send it out to everyone so that they can review the recording um and then like i said the links for Nelson's book, our meetup page, everything will be in the chat. So make sure to follow us and download Nelson's book and then also send out um, Andrew's contact information as well, if he's okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> and we are especially excited that we had so much Canadian representation today. <laughs> thank thank you, uh, Kamesh, for moderating Andrew and, and Nelson. Hope to see everybody in a few weeks again. Thanks. Great. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye, guys.